Well, um, as we transition here into embracing God's Word, learning and reflecting on God's Word, uh, it's so wonderful to be able to worship with you and to uh, sing songs like we just sang. And I don't know if you're like me, but that last line in that song has always uh, stood out to me as a confession of truth, that I am a person that is prone to wander. Um, and I constantly need to be reminded that uh, my duty as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, is to surrender um, and to give my God my, God, my heart. Um, and so we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, temptation today and uh, this uh, wandering, um, this, this desire of the human uh, carnal part of us that is so often distracted um, and is prone to be dis- distracted and wander and go off into all different tangents. And so um, as we do, will you pray with me and we'll dive into God's word. Thank you, Lord, for these moments we have together. God, I pray that uh, your presence would just speak, Lord, resound in our hearts Lord, the things as we commune with you throughout the week in private, Lord, we bring them into this room together to share with one another um, all the love and relationship and prayer. Lord, fill this place uh, with your goodness, God. Open our hearts and our minds. Uh, Speak now, Lord, into uh, what your will is for our next steps. Lord, help us to uh, learn from your word. In your name we pray, amen. So we are in a sermon series called Out of the Dust, and last week we had a wonderful sermon on the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, and that really set the framework for the next few weeks here as we looked at Leviticus and then in Hebrews how Jesus is our once and for all, all all-time sacrifice for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. And so now what we're going to be doing is taking a look at some of the scenes of Jesus' final hours and to talk through how was it that uh, this Jesus, this amazing God-man, was able to do what he did for us. And if nothing else you get uh, this Sunday, get this encouragement to read Matthew chapter 25 all the way through the end of the gospel, and then to read it again and to read it slower, um, and to read it again and read it slower in this Lent season. And I guarantee you that you will find some of the most beautiful things you have ever read as you meditate on these final hours. And so uh, it's been a joy for me to look at our scene for today as Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so will you turn with me to Matthew chapter 26? And uh, I'll just read the scripture, and you can follow along in your Bible or on the screen, and then we'll talk about after. So it says this, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup 
to be taken away unless I drink it. May your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So uh, as we walk through this text together, one of the uh, first things we should be taking a note of is the context of this passage and so we see Jesus here is in a garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and there's a parallel, a, a basic parallel that the author of this gospel, Matthew, is trying to show us. He's kind of, if you will, if you uh, watch a movie and they clip back and forth, uh, you may think, okay, uh, here's the scene of Jesus in the garden, and yet there's another garden scene early, uh, you know, as Adam and Eve we see in the garden. And so the, the, the parallel here is the temptation of these two figures. See, Adam and Eve uh, tempted in the garden, um, and their temptation, right, is they, they are walking with God, they have shalom with God, they have peace with God, um, and yet Satan comes and his temptation for them is to have the knowledge of God, to become like God. And so this vertical rise is what they want. They want to become like God in the knowledge of good and evil. And so that is their temptation. And in contrast to that is Jesus, who began in heaven, divine, and willingly surrendered himself, taking on human flesh, moved into the human neighborhood um, and in this moment, his greatest temptation is revealed to us that the cup of suffering that comes with being human is something that seems unbearable, the pain that comes for this God who is continuously moving lower and lower and lower and lower and is discovering what it is to be truly human the pain, the suffering, the cup of wrath. And so we see these two parallel stories. And Matthew, uh, I mean, excuse me, Matthew, uh, um, Adam and Eve in the garden, they, they succumb to their temptation. Uh, they they uh, give in to their curiosity and desire, and they hide. And not soon after that, their descendants, uh, Cain and Abel, two sons, are given in this story. And Cain and Abel give us the consequence of their failure uh, to resist temptation. And the first murder scene, the first uh, death in the, in the Bible we see in this story as Cain kills Abel. And out of that death, we see the first prayer go up to heaven, and the prayer comes from a mysterious place. Genesis 4.10, the Lord is speaking to Cain, and he says, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The cries cannot be hidden. And so the picture here is a broken earth crying out. The blood spilled, crying out. And as his descendants, or as his parents before him, Cain is trying to hide. But there is no hiding from God. Because even the, the earth itself, the blood, will cry out from the ground. And we see echoes of this in Romans 8.22. It says, The creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And so this 
is a big brokenness that is taking place. It's the breaking of the entire world. And so the first lament is the lament of the earth crying out because of the sin of the world. And so we see Jesus here praying too in the garden. And his prayer is a prayer, they call it the cry of the cup. That's what the church has called this. Um, his, His first prayer is a lament prayer. As Jesus is our great pastor of all of us, uh, his great prayer was thinking of all of the humanity, all of the brokenness, all of the sin, um, and crying out to God because of the weight of that sin that he was being called to carry on his shoulders was so great um, that it caused him deep trouble and grief and sorrow unto death. This is called the cry of the cup. And in one chapter later in Matthew 27, we see the cry again of dereliction, it's called in the church, where Jesus is on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dereliction means abandonment, a loneliness. Um, And so Jesus is teaching us here when we as the human race uh, experience what we know to be true, that there is a cup for all of us, that there is a suffering that all of us are going to encounter and embrace, and we are prone to wander away from that pain, prone to Uh, be like Cain and Adam and Eve and want to deny that pain, want to numb that pain. And so Jesus is giving us a prayer posture here, a prayer rhythm to help us to deal with our pain. And so his first movement is to cry, but he doesn't just cry out to God, but he positions himself in the dust. It says that he put his face to the ground. And this was a a common practice. Actually, the word for worship in the Hebrew Bible, shahana, is uh, literally can be translated as putting your face in the dust. And the rabbis comment on that by saying that, uh, that the good Jew would put his face in the dust to remind him that from dust he came and to dust he shall return. And that only because of God's breath of life breathed into that dust will humans take form. And so every prayer comes from a posture of surrender, from the knowledge of our mortality. And we humans are strung in these paradoxes, uh, light and darkness. Jesus here is in the paradox between divine and human, life and death. These are the great paradoxes we all live in. Um, And we are strung tightly in the tension between these two poles. And could you imagine this scene where Jesus is not doing what would be recommended by perhaps some great leadership books as he is expressing his deepest, darkest emotion. He's giving us a glimpse of him being at his weakest in his confusion, dealing with these two poles, deeply troubled and sorrowful, depressed and broken. He's crying out, What if the church was a place where every human emotion was allowed? What if God was a God who allowed for every human emotion? What if he knew the deepest cries of your heart before you ever said them? before you even had words to form into prayers, 
he already knew. But as you form your words into prayers, what happens is you begin to conform yourself. You begin to bring them in alignment with God. And so your cry leads you to a surrender. And that's the journey that we see Jesus on here. His first prayer, take this cup for me. His second prayer, as he sees the disciples napping, he comes back. Second prayer is a movement to, but if I drink this cup, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. That's the Lord's, Lord's prayer. Jesus doesn't just teach us how to pray. He prays the same prayer with us. And it's not a prayer where we bring our list of needs to God. It's actually a prayer that aligns ourselves with the will of God. So prayer is a time where we tune ourselves into the will of God and discover what he wants for our lives. And so we see a parallel in this in 27 as well. Jesus cries out the prayer of dereliction on the cross, and then he surrenders his spirit to God on the cross. So there's the cry and the surrender. The cry and the surrender. These are the ways, as human beings, we're given as the pathway into encountering, embracing, dealing with, and going through our suffering as well. The songwriter John Foreman says that between these two poles of life and death, we, there is a tension string that he likes to say is like a guitar string. And we know these things for us are difficult to talk about, life and death. These are the hardest things to talk about. And yet we live in the tension. And so he says that our goal is to play the most beautiful song, to strike the deepest chord we possibly can with this tension in the guitar strings. If you ask an amazing runner how they got so fast, they will say, because I suffered. If you ask a great writer how they have a bold voice, they will say, because I suffered. If you ask Jesus how he saved the whole world, how he played the most beautiful song that humanity has ever heard, he will say, because I suffered. And so may we too heed Jesus' example. Because we also see that the three naps of the sons of Zebedee and their friend Peter were preceded by the three failures just soon hours after that. Because the three that were not willing to pray were the three that were not able to resist temptation. And so prayer for us is the way that we discover our ability to go through the things that burden us, that we carry on our shoulders the weight and care of the world, the brokenness and sin disease that we all succumb to, And so, may you discover that when you are in the midst of your deepest suffering, it is an opportunity to play the most beautiful songs. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, that you, uh, that you have begun in us uh, a work to look at you and how you lived this life. We bring our cries, 
we bring all those imperfections, we bring all of those mysteries, Lord, all that confusion and sorrow, depression that we feel, Lord, and we lay it at your feet. God, not our will, but yours be done on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray, amen.